Hello everyone. This is my copy of a book called Ur of the Chaldees, which was written by a very famous archaeologist called Sir Leonard Woolley. Um, Woolley wrote the book uh, in the 1920s, it was published in 1929, and he wrote a revised version in 1954. Um, but this particular edition it dates from 1982. Um, Woolley had uh, died long before 1982. Um, so this book is a, a revised and updated version of Woolley's original book by a Dr. P.R.S. Mooney, Maury, beg your pardon, who was, um, I believe it tells you in the fly here, um, he was Senior Assistant Keeper in the Department of Antiquities at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And he himself had been taught by um, an archaeologist called Sir Max Malloan, who had actually worked with Woolley um, in the 1920s, I believe. So there's a kind of an apostolic tradition going on there. Um, but anyway, Ur, Ur, the city of Ur, is, uh, a, was an ancient Sumerian city, um, the remains of which are in uh, what is now southern Iraq. So it's an ancient Mesopotamian city. And um, Woolley excavated the site in the 1920s. Um, unfortunately, um, his work being overshadowed, really, by um, things that were happening in Egypt, um, in particular um, Howard Carter's discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings. But really, the, th the, the way Woolley worked and the things he uncovered um, really kind of um, equal, I would say, um, what, what was discovered in, in Tutankhamun's tomb. But it's never really been in the public's mind um, to the same degree as Tutankhamun's treasures. Um, but uh, this particular book has helped kind of counter that, that, that Woolley had a very um, uh, clear and uh, approachable style of writing. Um, so this book is easily read by uh, the lay person such as myself. You don't have to be an archaeologist to appreciate uh, this book. Um, and Woolley himself is, is famous for his kind of very methodical, systematic approach to archaeology, but combined with um, an incredible ability to be able to um, kind of imagine um, the uses of the, you know, the, the, the basically, he, he was able to accurately extrapolate from what he excavated um, exactly what went on virtually in each room of the of the site um, so he, he's he, he, he's produced a really kind of wonderful almost three-dimensional <laughs> um, you could say uh, um, account of the ancient city of Ur um, the, the most remarkable um, part of the site that he excavated were the royal tombs. Um, and this, this, this dates back to, as you can see from the title here, um, 2600 to 2450 BC. So you're talking about four and a half thousand years ago. And these tombs were quite... Um, macabre because they were all approached, I think there's about five or six of them, they were all approached by ramps um, that led down into the into the tombs, uh, long winding ramps that were absolutely um, chocked full of the remains of people who had clearly been um, who, had, who had died at the same time as the, the funeral of the royal personage in the tomb. So Woolley's kind of reconstruction of it, let's see if I can find a... I'm not going to find one now so easily. Um, but Woolley's, Woolley's kind of interpretation of events was that... Um, 
the all these people had basically followed the 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 ruler or the princess or whoever it was down into the tomb and all um, had self-administered poison um, and died on the spot and, and accompanied their ruler into the into the afterworld. So it's people like um, slaves and servants, um, bodyguards, that kind of thing. Um, they all happily, or maybe unhappily, um, took their own lives so that they could carry on serving their ruler in the next next world. And not only were these people there, but they went with chariots, with all kinds of um, artifacts, which uh, you can see illustrated in this book. Um, this, this is the great thing about this 1982 edition, that the original editions just had a kind of uh, illustrations and maps, but they didn't have photographs. Um, and the photographs really helped to kind of bring it bring it to life. I think even even more so than uh, the, um, Woolley's original vocabulary. Um, but anyway, cut to the chase. Um, one of the things that was found in the tomb of uh, one of the royal princesses was this gaming board here. Um, now the the original. Um, script of Woody's book just describes it such. Um, so he goes on he goes on about a chariot that was found. He says in front of the chariot lay the crushed skeletons of two oxen with the bodies of the grooms by their heads, and on the top of the bones was the double ring once attached to the pole through which the reins had passed. It was of silver and standing on it was a gold mascot in the form of a donkey most beautifully and realistically modelled. Close to the chariot were an inlaid gaming board and a collection of tools and weapons, including a set of chisels and a saw made of gold, big bowls of grey soapstone, copper vessels, a long tube of gold and lapis, which was a drinking tube for sucking up liquor from the bowls, more human bodies, and then the wreckage of a large wooden chest adorned with a figured mosaic in lapis lazuli and shell, which was found empty, but perhaps a uh, contains such perishable things as clothes. So this gaming board, it has a very brief mention in the original book. In this 1982 edition, it has a photograph to kind of pique your interest. Um, fast forward uh, to the present day, and there is an, another remarkable man who is a curator at the British Museum by the name of um, Irvin Finkel. Um, he is quite a character. I can highly recommend that you um, Google him on YouTube because he has a number of YouTube videos out there. Um, his appearance is that of a kind of cross between an Old Testament prophet and Gandalf and Ben Gunn and maybe... Um, I don't know, the prisoner of Zender or something like that. He has a, a, a long grey beard and long hair tied tied at the back, um, glasses, and he he looks like the sort of person that's been kept uh, confined in the bowels of the British Museum for the last 50 years and has barely ever seen daylight. But in fact, when you hear him talk, he is the most personable um, person and uh, full of uh, witticisms and so on. But, he, but his um, chief role is curator at the British Museum, and his chief role is to uh, look after and to analyse and display um, all the cuneiform tablets, clay tablets that they have in the museum, um, of which I think there was something like 130,000. And anyway, he... Um, he he sort of has been at the British Museum a great many years and, like Woolley, has worked this very systematically and assiduously. And at one stage, um, he has always been interested in this game himself. Even, even he describes being in the museum as a boy of nine years old and 
uh, being intrigued by this game and making his own model of it and um, trying to work out the rules for it. Um, but when during his period as curator, um, one of the cuneiform tablets that dated to about 200 BC um, was translated and it actually had a description of the rules for this game in it. Now this is some nearly two and a half thousand years after this particular gaming board was interred at Ur. Uh, um, the game was immensely popular across the Middle East and the ancient world, right the way down um, from Mesopotamia, stretching out to Egypt in the west and India in the east. And there's even a kind of version of this game that was found um, in the 1920s in Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, and Irvin Finkel, as well as being an expert in the interpretation of cuneiform script, um, has a particular interest in ancient board games, and he made he had made it his kind of task to try and work out the rules for this game. And obviously, the cuneiform tablet um, dating from 200 BC helped him enormously in that task. Um, but he went further than that. He went on to discover that. Um, the game had been scratched out on pavements in temples in India and so on. And um, the, the, the scratchings on the pavements in stone can't be dated, so he wasn't sure what particular period that dated from. But he went, he went on further to discover that um, there, there had been a Jewish community in, at the port of Cochin in India um, and this community went back right to the time of the, um, the, the Israelite captivity in Babylon. Um, and when, when they had been released from their captivity, a great many Israelites went back to the Middle East. But another group of them had actually um, ventured down into India, and that was the um, origin of the... Um, the community in Cochin in India and he found incredibly that this game was still being played or a version of it was still being played um, by that Jewish community right up till the 20th century and he then went on to find uh, to meet an elderly Jewish woman who was in her 90s by, by the time he um, he met this woman who had um, uh, travelled back to Israel in 1947 when the state of Israel had um, been created. And he met this woman and he interviewed her about the game and she was able to give him further details on how it was played and so on. So he came up with the absolutely brilliant idea of recreating the game um, so that it could be sold by the British Museum. And as soon as I heard about this, which was only last week, although the game's been around, uh, this particular game has been around for at least a few months now, um, I just had to buy it. It's expensive, £70, um, but just look at it, well worth it. Um, So this is the, the, the board itself, um, it doesn't tell you, it's, it certainly sounds wooden, I might tell you on here what material it's made of, um, it says it's a serigraphed reproduction from original Chilzeldic, I can't even pronounce it, board in the British Museum, so I don't know what the material is, but um, I think that's a kind of wood, I'm not sure. Um, just compare it to the, the photograph of the original. How's that going around? So you can see they've been a little bit um, inventive with the design. Um, they've, been, they've kind of uh, tarted up a little bit of it, not, not to a huge extent. 
Um, I mean, it is pretty much um, an accurate kind of portrayal of the original board. Um, and I just love it. I just, I just find this fascinating. Um, just that sort of link to, um, to the past in that way, the recreation of an artefact. But the game itself, it, the reason it was so successful is that it is a challenging game. Um, it's, it's kind of closest, uh, closest um, relation in the modern day would probably be the game of backgammon. Um, so it's not just a simple kind of game of chance. It does involve strategy as well and like backgammon it involves you moving onto squares and knocking off your opponent's pieces um, forcing that person to to start again so you have two groups of counters um, I think there are seven Let's see yeah seven of each color and these are the dice. These are the dice. Now, just as another aside, um, wouldn't it be great if those wargamers out of you who play ancient wargames, particularly games such as Gary at Wargaming with Gary, the period he plays of uh, ancient Assyrians and so on, wouldn't it be fantastic if someone invented a set of rules that used dice like this? They're not what you might think at first glance they would be um, four-sided dice They're, they are they are more sophisticated than that and I'll have to refer to my chart to um, to tell you how you score basically you've got three dice um, they're tetrahedrons and two corners on each dice are marked white so you roll all three, and a certain number of the, the uppermost points will be marked. Um, now, I'm sure it's easy to do, work out the odds of the configurations turning up, but basically, if you roll so that all three tops are marked, that gives you five points. If you roll so all three tops at blank, that gives you four points. If you roll so that two corners are blank, which is what I actually did when I rolled them a moment ago, that is worth nothing. That is zero points. And if you roll so that one corner is blank, that gives you one point. Now. Working out the odds of how likely each um, roll is likely to be is quite crucial for the game. So there is a certain amount of um, not just strategy but calculation in this. Because what you are doing is you are moving around, I'll show you the manner in which you do it, around this board in a particular way. And if you land on an opponent's square, um, you knock them off and they have to start again. So working out if you are in jeopardy or not um, is quite critical and um, and taking risks in where you place your, your counters and so on. So basically um, the way this uh, description um, shows the route around the board is actually different from the route taken by um, a YouTube video example where Irving Finkel plays one of his um, colleagues. Um, Irving, on Irving Finkel's video he started here and the opponent started here and you move your piece along that way to the middle here so this is where you're competing for space up that way and around like that and then you came off there. These rules I think are an improved version of that or maybe maybe they're corrected version but they certainly, certainly make the game more challenging because you start here 
you move to there, which is safe, then you move to there, so you're now on shared territory, you then move up to here, all the way around there, like that, and then back, and you have to come off here. Um, so that gives you a lot more area that you're actually competing with your opponent um, to share. Um, and I think the reason they've changed the rules in that way is that they've tried to fathom out what the significance of the pattern markings on, on the board are. Um, they already had realised that if you're on a rosette, you're safe and you can't be knocked off. Um, there are certain other markings, such as this one, this one here, for instance. Um, I've only just got this, so it says, it says when a marker lands on that square, it's turned over to dif differentiate them from other markers. I'm not quite sure why you need to do that. I'll have to play this game anyway myself and uh, give it a try out. Um, when you land on this square here, which has got different marking, then in order to get off the board, you need to, sc you need to roll a four. So the idea is you have to throw the correct number to land on there, and then you have to roll four points in order to take however many pieces you've got on that square off. Um, so it's quite clever because it might seem as though you're in a, in a winning situation, but you'll, you'll stay on that particular square for quite a long time and then there's always the possibility that your opponent is going to land on that square and force all the pieces you've got on there to start again. So it's a kind of... Um, it's a cross between backgammon and a far more sophisticated kind of version of Ludo because there's strategy, tactics and calculation involved. It's not just a matter of chance. Um, but anyway, wonderful, wonderful looking game. Really nice um, object to, to own. Um, look at the way... I mean, it all packs into a box that size. So... Portable, you could take it to play on holiday, you could take it on trains, carry it around with you, it almost fits in someone's pocket. Um, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, all credit to Irving Finkel for coming up with the, the idea of uh, allowing the public to enjoy the, um, the fruits of his years of labour. One thing I would say, though, um, which I did spot earlier, um, which has nothing to do with the British Museum, because this game was is produced and printed in, in Spain, and the instructions are printed in Spain, is that they talk about um, the Sumerian city of Ur being discovered by the British archaeologist Sir William Woolley. Um, who was William Woolley? It's not even spelt correctly. It's spelt W O. Sorry, W double O L E Y and Leonard Woolley surname was W double O double L E Y. Um, so there's a little bit of a uh, an error there, but uh, small fry compared to the, the joy that people are gonna get from playing this game. So there we go. Thought I'd show you that. Thanks very much for watching and see you again on the next video. Bye for now.